We'll be in the book of Hebrews in just a minute. If you want to turn. Follow with us. I want to emphasize that God loves you. God cares what you do. He cares what you are doing. A lot of times we think nobody cares. You always will know that God cares. I think that says so much, that God loves me in spite of my shortcomings. He's wanting me to want less and less of my shortcomings, that I might allow Him to live more heavily in my life. I can look at the attitude of God and know what He expects of me. Philippians 2, 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. And we work to change our mind to be as His mind, that we might be able to live Him in the world wherein we live. We'll be in Hebrews 1, a passage that no doubt you've read a number of times, but... We're going to try to really break it apart to understand it. I find it awfully fascinating the way God begins this book. He said, God, who at sundry times and divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his son. Hmm. First point I get is that God speaks to us. You know, immaterial of your politics, and I'll pick both parties to make it immaterial of your politics. If Trump were to come to Kemp to speak, I bet you'd want to be there. If Bill Clinton were to come to Kemp to speak, I bet you'd want to be there. And these are folk who are so much less significant than Jehovah God that it's unbelievable. Both have proven their shortcomings and their fallacies. God who at sundry times and divers' manners spake. Huh. I think that I look and I realize that God has something to say to you and me. I mean, we talk about, well, I don't have time to study the Bible and I don't this and that and the other but if someone that we esteem as a great person were speaking, we would want to hear. <coughs> Greater than any person that you and I have ever known or heard of is Jehovah God, and He's speaking. Why is God speaking to us? God is speaking to us because He wants us to understand Him. He wants us to know Him. I got to want to know him. I've got to want to understand him. It's more crucial than anything I know or understand. Knowing God. Don't we identify with that? Don't we say, I hadn't thought of it exactly that way. God who at sundry times and divers manners. Ooh, we listen to the different times and different ways and different manners that God has spoken to us. God spoke when we went off into Egyptian captivity. What did I learn about what He had to say? 
God spoke when He brought us out of Egyptian captivity. What did I learn about what He had to say? God spoke when He allowed us to cross the Red Sea on dry land. What did I learn about what He had to say? God spoke when we walked 40 years in the wilderness and He wouldn't let us grab bread for two days. We had to grab bread every day. Did we learn what he had to say. I can take care of you day by day. You don't need to spend all of your energies storing up. I can take care of you. Huh. God who at sundry times and various manners God spoke when we went into Babylonian captivity. God spoke when we went into Assyrian captivity. God has spoken. Have I listened? I'm not dumb enough to not know what he said. I may be dumb enough to not focus on what he said, but I'm not unable to understand what he had to say. And I find that so interesting as I look at that. Sundry times and divers manners. God spake unto the fathers by the prophets. You know, I, I think it's, I, I just like the fact that God took the initiative to speak to me. Oh, he spoke to you too. But I like to make it personal. God spoke to me. I want to know what he's got to say. I'm mindful of 2 Peter 1, 21. says, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. God breathed all of the men that he used to speak. He breathed into them what that which they spoke. God influenced all of the speaking all the way through the old, all the way through the new. God influenced the speaking. Hmm. He's taking the initiative. He wants you and me to know him. Do we want to know Him? You know, a lot of people serve a God that never says a word. Never says a word. They serve gods that are little idle. You know, little short, fat, dumb looking thing. I can't imagine that. How do you serve a God that never speaks? How would you ever know what he wants if he never speaks? That means that my religion is what I think. And even those who claim to have the same religion may have a different thinking. We have the opportunity for unity by listening to what our God speaks. Hmm. I like Jehovah. More than like Him, I love Jehovah. But I like His ways. His ways are, I'm going to tell you about me. Would you like to know? Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Hmm. You know, if you turn back to Genesis 1, hold Hebrews, we'll be back. But I want you to just notice. And I just went through and underlined. 
It says in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We know, we know Genesis 1.1. 1, 1. But look at 1.3. And God said, let there be light. Had you ever underlined the word said in that verse? Huh? Verse 5. And God called the light day. That indicates speaking. Verse 6. And God said, said, let there be firm. Verse 8, And God called the firmament heaven. Huh. Verse 9, And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place. Verse 10, And God called the dry land earth. Verse 11, And God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit after his kind. That's so important right there. It was God who said things would reproduce after their kind. Can you imagine how confusing this world would be if God hadn't said that? This world would be totally confusing. If God hadn't said, everything will reproduce after its kind. Huh. Verse 14, and God said, let there be lights in the firmament. Huh. Verse 20, and God said, let the waters bring forth abundantly. Verse 22, and God blessed them saying. Verse 24, and God said... Verse 26, and God said, let us make man in our image. Verse 28, and God blessed them and God said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Verse 29, and God said, behold, I've given you every herb bearing seed. I guess I'll let it go at that. God spoke into existence you and me and the world that we live in. Would I like to hear what he has to say on other subjects? Of course I would. Of course I would. Well, he's given it to us to hear what he has to say on other subjects. You name any product you've got in your barn or your shop, and the person that knows the most about that product is the fellow that invented it or created it. If I want to know about humanity, I need to go to the person who created it to learn what a man needs to be, to learn what a woman needs to be, to learn how a man and woman interrelate, to learn about the world that's about us. Hmm. I'm impressed. God who at sundry times and divers manners spake unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days hath in these last days. Last days is set over against the first time he spoke. Hath in these last days spoken by his son. We're living in the last days. Ever since Jesus began to speak, we've been in the last days. Don't let a radio or TV preacher scare you by telling you you're in the last days. You are, but you've been in them 2,000 years. And if I were not impressed with the fact that I need to get right with God and stay right with God, I needn't let somebody scare me who doesn't know when the final day of the last days will come. I think chances are way better that your last day will come 
before the last day of all of us will come. Mm. Then I need to pay attention to his son's talk because he spoke. Hmm. You know, I find that interesting. Jesus began a new era. Jesus divided time. Our forefathers were smart enough to know that. We've got B.C. and A.D. Because our forefathers were smart enough to know that Jesus separated time. Wow. I guess some of our forefathers were pretty religious folk. Good guess. Pretty religious folk. Jesus split time. Hmm. But look as he goes on. Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Now you can find in verse 5. For unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my Son. This day have I begotten thee, and again I will be a father. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. Hmm. I'll look at that. I find it important. And then I find things about the son and about the world, and he lists seven of them that I think are so, so interesting just to begin the book of Hebrews. Thirteen chapter book. But the first four verses are loaded, loaded, loaded. Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. That's number one. God took care of the end before he began with the beginning. You see that? Whom he hath appointed heir of all things. The son is the heir of it all. God appointed him that. God said, son, I want you to be the heir of all things. It's yours now. It's your world. It's your people. Try to teach your people about your world and about your salvation, about all the things that are you, because you are the heir of all things. Wow. What an inheritance. By whom also he made the world. Second thing he says, after he got it started, he then began the creation. You are not only the heir of all things, by whom, by you, I want to make the worlds. Now you remember John 1 and verse 3, but it's important to put it in verse here, right here. He says in verse 3, all things were made by him. Hmm. You remember in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 10 says, he was in the world, and the world was made by him. Okay. I understand that. And I see what he's saying. That he's suggesting that he's getting the world started. Ah, we could go to Colossians 1. I think the point's sufficient. But look at the third thing that he says. Who being in the brightness of his glory, is to what the King James says. I'm in the book of John's back again. Look at John 40, 14. <laughs> Not 40. John 14. Oh, we'll start about verse 8. Philip saith unto him, Lord, show us the Father, and it sufficeth us. Philip wanted to see the Father. Jesus saith unto him, Have I been so long time with you, and yet hast thou not known me, Philip? He that hath seen me hath seen the Father. I underline that. You want to know the Father? 
Take a look at the boy. That's what he says. You want to know the father? Look at me. You know, you've heard of chip off the old block, spit an image. That's, that's what's here. He said, you want to know my father? Look at me. And how sayest thou then? Show us the father. Believest thou not that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, the words that I speak unto you, I speak not of myself, but the Father that dwelleth in me, he doth the words. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. He's saying there's enough evidence off of what I've done that you know that I am God. I've given you evidence, but I am just as my Father. And even if you don't accept that, how do you explain the crippled man walking? How do you explain the blind man seeing? How do you explain that I've created the world and you? Come up with an explanation or believe it, he says. You can't just say, I don't believe it. You've got to explain yourself and your world. Honesty declares you can't just say, I don't believe it. You've got to explain what's here. Hmm. He goes on. The fourth one. He says... There that he is the express image of his person. That means he's the exact image of his person. And the word that's used there is as a die stapping a coin. Those coins all look alike that are stamped by the same die. He says, I am the exact image of his person. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of him that sent me. He says, I am the exact image of his person. You want to know who God is? Take a long, deep look at Jesus and you'll come to know who God is. I got to want to know who God is. I've just got to want to know who God is. It seems like too much is at stake for me to not want to know who God is. Hmm. But he goes on. And I find this so interesting. King James says, "...and upholding all things by the word of his power." But the word upholding could be translated also sustaining all things by the word of his power. You know, we've spent different times in our society. We're worried the world's going to go away because of global warming is the last one. But you can back up and there have been things that everybody thought, whoa, whoa, whoa. God said, Hebrews 1, I've put things in order and in place and they will just continue to go in the order that I've put them. Well, our world's going to burn up. God smiles and says, no. Well, I'm, I'm afraid, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, it, it, it's drowning out people. He said, I can't help the fact you built in the wrong spot. But the world is not drowning. I put it together. How do we even explain the fact that our bodies heal ourselves? And that God gave some of us enough sense to figure out a way to help us to keep our bodies continuing to heal themselves. That God put that all in the roll at the beginning. And it continues to roll. God is sustaining us. I can't think of a way to not want to know a God like that. I see what he's doing and how he's helping me. 
Now I'll go to your Colossians 1 passage, 15 through 17. And look at what he says. Speaking of Jesus as the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created. There it is again. You see verse 16? That are in heaven and that are at earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him. Oh, that means God put that goofball in place over at North Korea. <laughs> That means God put Trump in place over in the U.S. Huh. All things were created by him and for him. Well, God, I don't know why you did that. He said, you may never figure it out either. I just want you to know who did it. And I want you to respectfully submit because your submission is not to him, it's to me. And I put things together that will sustain my world. And my world is way bigger than your world. Look at 17. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. God said, I know the role of the world. And I'm telling you that what's happened is what's good to happen. I'm telling you this is the way it ought to be. I'd like for you to understand that the laws of nature, that's what you call them, laws of nature, I'm the fellow that put it in. You figured out it was going to happen that way every time, and you called it a law of nature. Oh, no, 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 no. I did that. Nature doesn't make laws. Nature is not animate with a mind. I put in place, and you dawned on you that these things were always going to happen this way, and you called them laws of nature. You named gravity, gravity. I didn't name it. But you're right. If you jump off a building, you're going all the way to the ground. Laws of nature. He said, by the way, I not only have the power to set in place the laws of nature, I have set in place my ability, ability to interrupt the laws of nature. Oh, I guess that explains a flood, a tornado. I can set in place the laws of nature and I can interrupt the laws of nature. Wow, maybe I need to submit to you, God. He said, that's what I'm trying to talk about. I'm hoping that that's exactly what you're figuring out. Notice the thick thing he says. Well, I've got to point out, he's sustaining by the word of his power. He says, I'm interrupting a law of nature. He interrupts it. When he had by himself purged our sins. He's talking about the cross and everything to do with the cross. God has given us a microcosm of the whole of world and life. And it's God who purged. That doesn't mean that none of us have sins. It means that God set forth a way we cannot be accountable for our sins. God set that forth. Okay. I guess I need to pay attention to that. Yep. And look, oh, so strong. Don't read this too quickly. It says that then he sat down at the right hand of God. You know why he sat down? At the right hand of the majesty on high. Because he was finished. Work's over. He going to sit down. He sat down with his father. Wow. 
Look at chapter 8, verse 1. Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. You see that sum? We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven. He summed it up. He's the high priest. He's our advocate. He's the propitiation for our sins. He's had a seat. He did it. Now, the thing that I find so, so interesting, and I, I just can't leave this out. Look at Hebrews 10. I want us to see this, the contrast of the high priests of the Old Testament and our high priest, Jesus. Look, starting in verse 11. And every priest standeth daily ministering. Daily! The Old Testament high priest is ministering. And offering oftentimes the same sacrifice which can't even take away sins. Daily offering for repetitively and they don't work anyway. Jesus went to the cross once and for all and had a seat because his work is finished. Wow. If we've never impressed with, been impressed with God, I see no way to not be impressed with God now. Wow. And he's speaking. But look as he goes on. We read verse 11. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God, from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. The enemies are sin, and that will be made his footstool. For by one offering he hath perfected forever them which are sanctified. Hmm. And then look at verse 4. And the lesson is ours. Being made so much better than the angels. <laughs> you know, there are people that worship angels. He said, don't worship angels. He is so much better than the angels. He is God. Being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. What is his name? He inherited son. He inherited son of the most holy majesty. He inherited as the high priest. He inherited God. He's got the name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow. Philippians says. And every tongue should confess that Jesus is Lord to the glory of God. Every knee should bow. We don't want to move from our seat, but we want to bow our knee. And we want our mouth to say, Jesus is God. Because he spake and we heard. And therefore, we believe. If you're not a Christian, or you've pulled away and you want to pull